Betrayal is an inevitable and inescapable reality that we all must go through. I should have seen this coming. I should have seen this coming. One of the most disorienting things about betrayal is the shock factor. How could you do this to me? I can never trust you again. I thought you were my friend. I thought you were my friend. The end result of betrayal is that your strength leaves you. It breaks you in ways that cannot be easily repaired. Family, as we get ready to receive a word from the Lord, won't you bow with me in prayer as we prepare our hearts, our minds, and our lives to receive the seed of God's word that we may bear the fruit of it in due season. God, we thank you for the precious gift of your word, which you've given to guide us, to lead us, to counsel us, and to comfort us. Pray, Holy Spirit, that you would enter this moment of preaching, both in preacher and in listener, in the hearing and in the doing of your holy word. We thank you, O God, for this moment. Be pleased and present now is our prayer as we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, today we come to the conclusion of a short series of sermons that I pray has been as much of a blessing to you as it has been real and relevant to me. This series entitled Betrayed. And I've shared with you over the last few weekends, as I will reiterate today, that betrayal, the intentional, harmful action of someone you trust, is an inevitable, inescapable, and repetitious experience that all of us will endure throughout our lives. The same way Jesus, our Christ, was betrayed by his own disciple Judas, somewhere at some time, somebody or somebody's will betray you. I don't mean to burst your bubble, but at some moment, someone is going to set you up to take advantage of you. At some moment in your life, someone is going to lie to your face that they may have their way with you. At some moment, you're going to share some personal and private information with someone who's going to leak it out for no good reason. Somebody's going to steal from you when all they had to do was ask. Someone's going to pretend to be your friend only to find out that that friendship was fake and phony and that they had formed some alliances with your enemies behind your back. At some moment in your life, someone's going to target you, get close to you, use you, and betray you. Because betrayal is inevitable inescapable, and repetitious. As a matter of fact, so many of us have been betrayed that when I mention the term betrayal, someone pops up into your mind right now. Someone fits the very definition of someone who's taken advantage of you and hurt you. Someone who you trusted and they intentionally did you wrong. Betrayal is everywhere, especially in Scripture. And for the last couple of weekends, we've been looking at and listening to a profound, prolific, and prominent example of betrayal in that story between Samson and Delilah. Samson, the strongest man in the Bible, gifted and graced by God with unnatural human strength, this brother who can kill lions with his bare hand, who strikes down a thousand Philistines armed only with the jawbone of a donkey. And this strong man is ultimately done in and killed by a betrayal at the hands of a woman he thought he loved named Delilah. In part one of this series, under the title, I Can't Believe You Did That to Me, we looked at how and why it is the enemy uses betrayal in the life of a believer to get us so angry that we abort our assignment, to make us squander our strength trying to figure out why they could do that to us, and ultimately to cause us to doubt our discernment and how we let something like that happen to us. And that led into last week's sermon, part two, 
under the title, I should have seen this coming. And rather than blaming Delilah, we looked at Samson as a mirror of our own lives and how it is Samson had some weaknesses that, that left him vulnerable to what Delilah was setting him up for. And Samson, just like you and me, will always be hindered when we have a dysfunctional definition of love, when we fail to foster faithful friendships, and always when we have reached a point where our lives are not bringing God any glory. All of that left Samson vulnerable to missing the signs that Delilah was setting him up. We defined betrayal as the intentional, harmful action of someone you've trusted. And Mark, if the truth be told, that that's what makes it so hurtful and so painful. Not that it was accidental, but that it was intentional. And it came from someone I trusted. I'm not shocked when I'm betrayed by my enemies. I expect that. It doesn't hurt as much when it comes from a stranger. I can shake it off and walk away if I don't know you. But what hurts most is when it's someone I trusted someone I confided in and believed in, someone whom I thought we had built a relationship together, that, that I'd done too much for you for you to do that to me, that you somehow owed me more than what you did to me. When you realize that I had multiple opportunities to hurt you, to harm you, to take advantage of you, and I sacrificed that because I believed in our relationship and our friendship, and now you could turn around and do something like that to me. And as a result of that betrayal, I've now reached a place where I can't trust you anymore. Has life ever put you in that corner? Has someone's betrayal ever left that taste in your mouth? Have you ever looked at someone you once believed in and now have come to the place of realizing I can't trust you anymore? I'll suggest to you that that's exactly where Samson lands after he's betrayed by his first wife. By now, you know that the story of Samson is nestled in the book of Judges between chapter 13 and chapter 16. And I want to encourage you to make certain you read all four of those chapters. Today, I want to read a little small snippet beginning at the end of chapter 14 that explains to us how Samson reaches a place where he can't trust his wife anymore. Judges chapter 14, beginning in verse number 19, and then journeying in to chapter 15. At the end of chapter 14, we read these words. Then the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon and struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything, and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home. And Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had attended him at the feast. Later on, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson took a young goat and went to visit his wife. He said, I'm going to my wife's room. But her father would not let him go in. I was so sure you hated her, he said, that I gave her to your companion. Isn't her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. Man, there's so much in there, but I want you to hang your hat on these words that come at the end of verse 19. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home. I can't trust you anymore. Let me give you some cliff note context. Let me give you a little background before the breakdown. You recall that Samson in chapter 14 lays eyes on an unnamed Philistine woman from a place called Timnah. And Samson makes up in his mind that he loves her and wants to marry her. 
His parents try to talk him out of it, but you can't talk Samson out of what he wants. So they arrange the wedding. And in the middle of the wedding feast, which back then lasted seven days, Samson decides to have some fun with the Philistine men from his wife's hometown. He shares with them a little riddle, and he lays a bet out. And he says, you know what, if you can figure this riddle out by the end of the wedding feast, I'll give you 30 garments. But if you can't figure it out, you owe me 30. The Bible says that these Philistine men trying to get the best of Samson go back and forth, but after three days, they still can't solve the riddle. So they come up with a game plan B. They go to Samson's wife and they threaten to burn her father's house down to kill her and her father if she doesn't tell them the answer to Samson's riddle. She goes back to her newlywed husband and she says to him, you don't love me. If you loved me, you would tell me the answer to the riddle. Let me pause and preach to the mature and tell you that any conversation that begins with the words, if you loved me, are probably not going to go in your favor. She begs Samson to tell her the answer. Samson's response to his bride is, I didn't tell my mama and my daddy. Why would I tell you? Bible says for the next four days, she nags Samson and bothers him to give the answer. And finally, after four days of nagging, Samson tells his wife in confidence the answer to the riddle. At the end of seven days, when the reception for the wedding has come to an end, Samson now confronts the Philistine men from the town of Timnah. He asks them the riddle again, and they give him the answer. And Samson knows immediately where they got it from. His wife has betrayed him. His wife has taken the answer he gave her in confidence, and she has shared it with the men from her hometown. Samson goes down to Ashkelon, kills some men, pays off the bet, and the Bible says that in a fit of anger, Samson decides to leave his wife and go back to his father's house. Don't, don't you miss this. The reception is over. It's time for the honeymoon. And rather than going on the honeymoon, Samson is so angry that he leaves his wife and goes back to his father's house. Why? Because Samson now knows I can't trust you. Samson knows you have betrayed me. Samson knows I told you something in confidence and you gave it to some other men. And rather than going on his honeymoon, he's so angry about being betrayed and now knowing he can't trust her that he leaves her. Y'all, it gets so bad that her father even knows how bad it is. Her father, realizing that Samson has abandoned his wife, takes his daughter and gives her in marriage to Samson's best man from the wedding. She's now married to the best man. And when Samson comes back to get her, the father says this. He says, listen, you abandoned her. I thought you hated her. After everything that went down and after she betrayed you and after you left your honeymoon in anger, I was certain you hated her. And that's why I gave her to the best man. Y'all, y'all, the real issue for Samson is not that he lost the bet. The real issue is that he lost his trust in her. And I want to tell you today that when you've been betrayed, it's not just what they did that hurts you. It's the violation of the trust that you've lost. I thought I could trust in you. And now I realize I can't trust you anymore. Friends, I came by to ask you a question on this weekend. 
What do you do when you've lost trust in someone? What do you do when you were sure she was your friend and now you find out she was fake and phony? What do you do when you believed that was your brother, but now you found out he's betrayed you? What do you do when you realize you thought you were in love, but clearly you were there all by yourself? What do you do when someone you put your heart into and you trusted and journeyed with in life turns out to be the very one who stabs you in the back? What do you do when you've lost trust in the one who betrayed you? Well, if we look at life through the lens of Samson, I'll suggest to you that there are three paths in front of you that when you've been betrayed by someone you trust and you can't trust them anymore, you've got one of three choices to make about the road you're going to travel down. There are three roads in front of Samson and we can learn about all three of them as we look at his life. Let me tell you what those three choices are and then we'll examine them one at a time. When you've been betrayed, when someone you trusted has violated that trust, when you've been stabbed in the back, when you've been hurt by someone you believed in, when you realize I can't trust you anymore, you've got one of three choices. Retaliation, reconciliation, or separation. Let's lay them all out there. We see them in Samson. Reconciliation, excuse me, retaliation, reconciliation, separation. Retaliation, reconciliation, and separation. Let's start with retaliation. Retaliation, that desire and attempt to get even. And before we go even down the road of retaliation, let me say in the beginning what I'm going to say in the end. God is not in retaliation. I want to say it again. God is not in retaliation. Retaliation is a choice in front of you. But I want to definitively tell you that on the road of retaliation, you will not find the hand of God. That's a word all of us need to hear because retaliation, trying to get even, going after some payback, wanting someone to get a taste of their own medicine is an instinctive response once you've been betrayed. When you've been betrayed, retaliation always rises as the first option in your life. Ashley, I want you to know Samson lives for retaliation. Samson lives for revenge. There are two verses that really symbolize all of Samson's life. Let me give them to you. You'll see them in Scripture. They're both in chapter 15. In verse 7, Samson says this, I won't quit till I take out my vengeance on you. And in verse 11, when his own hometown asks him why he is the way he is, this is what Samson says, I just did to them what they did to me. I want to make sure you see this because these are the two verses that Samson lives by. Verse 7, I won't quit till I get revenge. Verse 11, I just did to them what they did to me. I want to say it again. Verse 7, I want revenge. Verse 11, I won't quit till I did to them what they did to me. Verse seven, I want revenge. Verse 11, I do to you what you do to me. And the reason I want you to remember verse seven and verse 11 is because all of us have some 7-Eleven inside of us. All of us have some, I want vengeance inside of me. All of us have some, I want to do to you what you did to me inside of us. If the truth be told, getting even feels good. If the truth be told, seeking out vengeance warms my heart. If the truth be told, getting you told and exposing you and putting in your place, it brings me some amount of comfort. All of us have some 7-Eleven inside of us. As a matter of fact, if you look back over the times you've been betrayed, no one 
has ever had to talk you into retaliation. No one's ever had to encourage you to seek vengeance. No one's ever had to tell you you ought to change your mind and go after somebody. Vengeance is natural. Retaliation is instinctive. And the enemy of righteousness, once you've been betrayed, will always try to convince you that you are justified getting even. The devil always has a way of making you feel that vengeance is justice. And let me tell you how trickery, how tricky the devil is. You ready? Here's what he'll do. He'll back it with some scripture. You, you'll hear th that, that passage from Exodus 21 in your ear, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And you'll think that God is justifying vengeance. Never mind the fact that that passage has nothing to do with getting even. That passage is a commandment of what ought to happen if a man hits a pregnant woman and kills the baby in the womb. That's eye for eye and tooth for tooth. This ain't got nothing to do with being betrayed and seeking vengeance. And if Exodus 21 doesn't get you, the devil will remind you of Galatians 6. God is not mocked. As you sow, so also shall you reap. That passage has nothing to do with vengeance. That passage is Paul reminding us that when we sow sin into the world, sin comes back to us. And that's exactly what we see in Samson. That his desire for revenge only brought more revenge. His thirst for vengeance only initiated more violence that his desire to get even ultimately came back and cost him. Look at the cycle of violence that is initiated by Samson. Samson is mad about the Philistines and what they did with his wife, so he takes vengeance. The Bible says he goes out and gets 300 foxes. He ties their tails together and puts a torch in the middle and lets them run out through the Philistine grain fields and the fires burn down all the field. When the Philistines find out about Samson and his vengeance, they take vengeance. They go to his wife's house. They burn it down. They kill her father. They kill her. When Samson finds out what they did, he takes vengeance, and he goes and kills the Philistines. When they find out what he did, they take vengeance. They go to the men of Judah and say, give us Samson. The men of Judah ask Samson why he's done that. He says, I just got to take vengeance. They turn him over to the Philistines. Samson takes a jawbone, kills a thousand of them. But they're not done. They take vengeance. They go and hire Delilah. Delilah sets him up. They gouge out his eyes. He pulls down pillars. He's killed. They are killed. It is a cycle of violence that never stops. Look at how much violence vengeance brought in. Look at how many innocent people are killed. Look at how many people who had nothing to do with it are now brought into the midst of it. Look at folk whose hands were clean are now forced to choose sides. And look at how his vengeance ultimately led to his own death. All because Samson lived by 7-Eleven. I won't quit until I get vengeance, and I'm going to do to you what you've done to me. Beloved, you've heard me preach this before, but I must say it again. One of the weaknesses of Samson is something that weakens each and every one of us, and that is the inability to learn to live with a loss. So many people in life are destroyed by a desire for vengeance because you don't know how to take the L. You don't know how to accept the loss. You don't know how to leave it behind you and try to press on. And I know what you're saying. Preacher, that's easier said than done. It's hard taking the L when you feel like somebody's gotten over on you. It's hard taking the L when they've done something irreparable to your life. It's hard taking the L when it seems like they betrayed you 
and set you up and all you want to do is get vengeance. And in that moment, in that moment, when it's hard to take the L, in that moment when you've been betrayed, in that moment when it's hard to trust, you've got a choice to make. Either put it in the hands of God or put it in your own hands. You've got to make a decision. Either give it to God or try to handle it yourself. And friends, that's where Samson made his big mistake. He tried to put it in his own hands. And let me tell you why that's unwise. Let me tell you why you shouldn't put it in your own hands. Let me tell you why you shouldn't try to handle it yourself. It's a simple lesson. Here's why you shouldn't put it in your own hands. You ready? Because evil can never be out eviled. Here's why you shouldn't put it in your hands. Because you can't get uglier than ugly. Here's why you shouldn't try to handle it. Because you can't get as nasty as nasty can get. Somebody I came by to tell you today, evil has never met its match. Ugly always has another ugly to go to. Petty always has someone pettier. And you can't beat betrayal with retaliation. You can't beat betrayal with retaliation. Let me say it a third time for those in the back. You can't beat betrayal with retaliation. You shouldn't put it in your own hands, but learn to put it in the hand of God. Why? Because God always has the final move. Why? Because God always has something up God's sleeve that you never saw coming. Why? Because God has options you can't see. God has alternatives you can't activate. God has ways of working it out that you will never be able to work out. Put it in the hands of God. Because God always has another move. Okay, someone's not feeling me. Back in the early 90s, there was a painting that hung in the Louvre Museum in Paris. The painting was called Checkmate. It was by an artist named Friedrich Retsch. And the painting was the portrait of Satan playing a man in chess over the fate of the man's soul. And in the painting, Satan has a devilish smile on his face as he's declared checkmate. And across the table, the man who believes his soul has been lost has his head hung low. I wanna make certain you see the portrait. You can Google it. It's Satan playing a man in chess over the fate of his soul. And Satan has a devilish grin declaring checkmate while the man's head is hung low. The story is told that one day a world chess champion was touring the Louvre. After he had seen Madonna, he came and saw the painting called Checkmate. He sat down and looked at the painting and sat there for several hours. After some time had elapsed, some of his friends came and asked him, why are you still here staring at that painting? And the man said, because there's something wrong in the painting. I play chess. He said, I'm looking at the pieces on the board and the devil is smiling, declared checkmate. The man's head is hung low because he feels he's lost. He says, but the problem is that it's not checkmate. It's just check. The friends who hadn't played chess said, what do you mean it's checkmate and it's not it's not checkmate, it's just check. And this is what the man said. The difference is that in check, the king always has another move. In checkmate, it's over. In checkmate, the king is done. But in check, the king has another move. And every now and then, Satan wants to put you in that place where it seems like somebody has gotten the best of you. Checkmate. They betrayed you. Checkmate. They broke your heart. Checkmate. But I came by to declare it ain't checkmate. It's just check because the God we serve always has another move. The God who stepped out into nothing has another move. The God who makes ways out of no ways has another move. The God who works it together for your good always has another move. I need somebody who's watching 
just to chat the word, check, check, check. The king has another move. Samson messed up because he put it in his hand. When you put it in your hand, that's the beginning of retaliation. When you put it in God's hand, that's the beginning of forgiveness. Let me say it again. When you decide to go down the road of retaliation and put it in your hand, that's retaliation. When you put it in God's hand, that's the beginning of forgiveness. I know somebody you're watching, you didn't turn on this service to hear that F word, but that's the word Jesus presses on us that we must learn to forgive. And forgiveness in its first step is not acting like something didn't happen. Forgiveness in its first step is not forgiving and forgetting because there's some things you've done I will never forget. Forgiveness is not acting like it didn't happen. Forgiveness is not instantaneously going back to the way things were. Forgiveness is not sitting back waiting on karma to come get them. Forgiveness is when you make the prayerful decision to release yourself from the desire of retaliation and to put this betrayal in the hands of God. I'm going to end the first part the way I began it. God is not in retaliation, but God is in forgiveness. The Lord's hand is not in retaliation, but it is in forgiveness. And what we see in Samson is that forgiveness takes two roads, reconciliation or separation. We're going to take retaliation off the board. What's left now in God's hands is either reconciliation or separation. Let's start with reconciliation. When you've been betrayed, one of the most difficult questions you must answer is simply this. Is God calling us to be reconciled? Is God calling us to restore and repair this relationship? Is it God's will for us to be back connected to one another? My brother, my sister, I come by to give you some tough news. Nobody can answer that for you but God. Your friends can't tell you the truth. Your counselor doesn't know. You can come see Reverend Morgan. She won't know the answer. You can ask your pastor. I don't know. Only you know if God is calling you to reconciliation. And the only way you know that is to pray. The only way you know if God is restoring it and repairing it is if you hear God speak that to you in your time in prayer. What we see, Brooke, is that Samson in chapter 15, after abandoning his wife in chapter 14, goes back and he tries to be reconciled. And in that reconciliation, we find three obstacles, three problems that keep him from being reconciled. The first is simple. He never prayed about it. Nowhere do we see Samson going before the Lord, asking God to guide him in what he ought to do in the relationship with his wife. Nowhere does he say, Lord, my heart is available to you. Nowhere does he ask God to guide his footsteps. Nowhere does he ask God to lift him above his feelings and help him see it from God's perspective. Nowhere does Samson pray. And the first mistake he makes is the biggest one that we make. We never pray. When we've been betrayed, we don't pray about it. We're angry about it. We want revenge. We tell all of our friends. 
but you cannot be reconciled without prayer. And I want to encourage you, no matter how badly it has hurt you, to make certain that you are laying this on the altar before God and asking God to speak to your heart and guide your footsteps and give you counsel and point you in the right direction. Lord, what do you want me to do in this relationship? You can never be reconciled without prayer. And Samson's first mistake, he didn't pray about it. His second mistake is equally bad. Samson seeks to be reconciled for the wrong reason. D -d Don't miss this. It's about to get a little deep. He didn't pray, but he also wanted to be reconciled for the wrong reason. Y'all, why does Samson go back to his wife after she's betrayed him? Read your Bible. I'm going to give it to you like it is in Scripture. It's PG-13. I got to leave it there. Here's what the Bible says. Samson went back because he wanted to go in his wife's room. Uh-huh. I'm, 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 I'm going to let you adult that um, and translate that as much as you want. Samson wanted to go back to his wife's room. Yeah, I'm, I'm leaving PG-13. Samson wanted to go back to his wife's room. Uh, Angie, Samson didn't go back to repair the marriage. Samson didn't go back to fix what had been broken. Samson didn't go back to work on their covenant vows for better or for worse. Samson went back because Samson wanted sexual pleasure. His desire was not to repair the relationship. His desire was to slide back into a place of comfort, convenience, and familiarity. I came by to preach to the mature today and tell you that you ought to be careful of letting your motive for reconciliation be comfort, convenience, and familiarity. You, you ought to be careful of trying to go back simply because you're tired of being alone. You, you ought to be careful of trying to reunite simply because it's familiar and it's all you know. You ought to be careful of allowing comfort, convenience, and familiarity to call you back into something that God has not ordained yet. Beloved, I, I, know, I know this is going to be tough for someone to receive, but comfort and familiarity will play tricks on your mind. The fear of loneliness will edit your memories. Convenience will romanticize the way it really went down. And you can desire it so badly because you know it and it's familiar to you that your mind begins to edit out how it really went down. And so now because of comfort and convenience and familiarity, you forget that they called you out of your name. You forget that they put their hands on you. You forget how they abused you and mistreated you. You forget how they violated your trust. You forget the damage they did to your life. You forget the hell they put you through because comfort, convenience, and familiarity are calling you into something that's caused you to forget how it really was. And my prayer for you is that when you're lonely, when you're afraid, when it's difficult being without them, that God give you a clear memory, that God makes certain you remember everything that went down. Because the problem with Samson is that he goes back to his wife and ain't nothing changed. He's the same Samson who wants vengeance. She's the same woman who betrayed him. He's the same husband who abandoned his wife and nothing has changed and there can be no reconciliation where there is no change. Samson didn't pray. Samson went back for the wrong reason. But watch this third problem with the reconciliation. I just said to you that neither one of them had changed. But you know what? I believe in the possibility of change. I believe that any life can change. Why? Because I know the power of grace and mercy on my own life. Anybody can change. 
And it's possible that betrayal can trigger change. It's possible that the guilt they feel for what they did triggers change. It's possible that the pain they see they inflicted on you causes them to change. Change is possible. But there's only one way to know. Here it is. Samson didn't pray. Samson went back for the wrong reason. But here's the third problem. Samson didn't have the courage to have the difficult conversation to prove change existed. I don't know who this is for, but I want you to get it, write it down. That reconciliation requires difficult conversation. Reconciliation requires difficult conversation. Last time, reconciliation requires difficult conversation. We can't pretend this didn't happen. We can't act like we're just going to walk back in here. We can't act like there's no accountability and explanation. And if we don't have the difficult conversation, how can there be reconciliation? We can't reconcile until we understand why this went down. We can't be reconciled until we talk about how things are going to change. We can't be reconciled until you know the depth of the pain you caused me in my life. We can't be reconciled until you sit and listen to what's in my heart. We can't be reconciled until we agree that God has called both of us into this. We can't be reconciled without the difficult conversation. Reconciliation is possible, but it requires a difficult conversation It requires the right reason, and it requires prayer. Forgiveness can take you down the road of reconciliation. God will never take you down the road of retaliation. But there's one more alternative, that God is in the forgiveness of reconciliation, and God is also in the forgiveness found in separation. This may be tough for some folk to hear, but you can forgive someone and still separate yourself from them. You can forgive someone and still determine that it's best we go our separate ways. You can forgive someone and still block them on your phone. You can forgive someone and still determine that it's best we not speak to one another. Beloved, here is the problem. We've convinced ourselves that separating always has to be ugly. It has to be nasty. It has to be vile. It has to be violent. But you can separate yourself from someone in a way that honors God. And the mature among us know that sometimes separating myself from you is the only way to maintain my peace with God and my sanity with myself. Sometimes walking away from you is necessary for me to get closer to God and stay in my right mind. Sometimes I've got to distance myself from you in order to get myself back together. That every now and then, separation is what God requires of us. You know who we see it in? We see it in Samson's wife. She gets her a new husband and keeps on moving. (laughs) She is not lamenting Samson. She's not crying over Samson. Why? Because she realizes that Samson's not good for her and she's not good for Samson. Beloved, every now and then, you've got to ask yourself, a difficult series of questions. Who do they bring out of me? And who do I bring out of them? 
Who do you bring out of me and who do I bring out of you? And if the me you bring out of me is misaligned with God's will, and if the you I bring out of you is not holy and righteous, then this cannot be where God wants us to be. I can't be in a relationship with anyone who brings the evil out of me and the ugly out of me and the petty out of me and the nasty out of me and the vulgar out of me and the violent out of me of me. I need someone who brings the God out of me. And if I bring the evil out of you and the low down out of you and the nasty out of you, y'all, we have a problem. Can I push this a little bit? Here's the problem. God never ordained Samson's marriage to his first wife. I can prove it to you. I want you to go back and read Exodus chapter 34. And in Exodus 34, the children of Israel are prohibited at that time from marrying Philistines. That's why Samson's mama and daddy tried to talk him out of marrying that woman in the first place because they knew that marriage could not be ordained by God. It was allowed by God, but it wasn't ordained by God. And y'all, if we'll be honest, there are a whole lot of things we've gotten ourselves in that were allowed, but were never ordained. And here's what I come by to tell you. It's hard to be reconciled where there was no ordained plan. It, it's hard to bring back together what God never put together in the first place. It, it, it's hard to, to make it fit and work when God never had God's hand on it to begin. God allowed it because you wanted it, but God never ordained it in his will. And every now and then you'll find that God may not orchestrate the separation but God will get some glory out of it. I, I feel like preaching there, God may not orchestrate it, but God can get glory out of it. It may not have been God's work, but God will get some glory out of the separation. I'm, I'm looking for some grown folk who can look back over your life and in retrospect, you can see the hand of God at work in the separation. I want to preach to some folk that can look behind you with 2020 vision and know that it hurt you at the time, but God was working in the background. God was behind the scenes. God was beneath the screen. God was working some things out that you clearly see now. God got some glory out of the separation. I look for some folk who know that weeping endured for a night, but after some days passed, joy did come. I want some folk who saw enemies come around you and thought you were destined for doom only to find out that God was just preparing a table that they would sit at while God blessed you. I'm looking for some folk that know that what started out as evil, God turned it into good. That, 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 that brother Mark is the story of Joseph. You remember Joseph, don't you? Betrayed by his brothers, thrown in a pit, left to die, sold into slavery. If anybody had a reason to hate his brothers, it was Joseph. But by the time God got finished with Joseph, by the time God worked it out for his good, by the time God finished writing his story, Joseph sat on the vice throne of Egypt as second in charge, because even though you've been betrayed, God has another way of turning your betrayal into your blessing. And y'all, here's, here's where it gets good. After the Lord had blessed him, and after he had been healed by his blessings, then God brought his brothers back in his presence so they can be reconciled. The separation was necessary for the reconciliation. That what you think is terminal may be God just healing you and getting you ready for a new relationship that he calls into being. 
Y'all, I got to go. I got to go. I thank you for being patient over these three weekends. Remember this. God is not in retaliation. God can be in reconciliation if you pray and have the right reason and have the difficult conversation. And God may be in the separation that is just setting you up for better reconciliation. We all will be betrayed and we all can live through it and come out better on the other side. Lord, thank you that you always have another move. Thank you that the betrayal of a once trusted person is not the end of our journey or our story. I pray today that as my sister, my brother receives this word, that retaliation would fall off their list of options, that you would speak of whether it's reconciliation or separation, but through it all, God, use the betrayal for our blessing. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Beloved, as we come to the end of this service, I pray that you've been blessed in worship. But beyond just blessed, challenged to make a commitment of a change in your life. If you're watching us today and you're not a born again believer in Jesus Christ, maybe you don't know what that means. We would love to share with you what it means and how it happens. On our website, you'll find a form you can fill out that will go directly to our deacons and ministers who will reach out to you immediately to share with you God's grace, God's love, and God's plan of salvation and forgiveness for your life. If you are a Christian and you're watching us and you desire to be part of this church family, you don't have to live anywhere near Alexandria to say, I want to belong to the Alpha Street Baptist Church. Fill that form out and we will reach out to you with open arms to welcome you to our family of faith. To everyone else, please join in with us as we seek to live out the principles and the practices of Jesus Christ in our daily living. And now, and to the Almighty, the All-Wise, the Eternal, the Sovereign, the Omnipotent God, who alone is Creator of heaven and earth, to the God who's made Himself perfectly known to us, in Jesus, who alone is our Christ, our loving Lord, our sacrificial Savior, our resurrected, risen, reigning, returning Redeemer, to the God whose presence is made known in these earthen vessels of clay, through the sustaining power, promise, presence, purpose and person of the Holy Spirit. To that wise God be glory and majesty, dominion and power from now until eternity. And the redeemed of the Lord who loved the Lord and awaited his return said amen. Yeah.